Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Dennis Lim, Director of Programming at Film at Lincoln Center, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this third and final anniversary talk to mark the 50th edition of New Directors, New Films. Uh, New Directors is, of course, an annual collaboration between Film at Lincoln Center and the Museum of Modern Art. It is one of New York City's oldest and longest running festivals, but it is also a festival that, by definition, renews itself every year. It's a showcase of emerging filmmakers, and so it's guided by a spirit of discovery, curiosity, uh, adventure. This year's festival is taking place virtually as well as in theaters. Uh, you can stream the films th from this year's lineup um, at the Film Link and MoMA websites. And um, you can also catch um, several of the films in the lineup at Lincoln Center's Walter Reed Theater. Uh, we have another week's worth uh, of in-cinema screenings. Uh, I'm delighted, of course, that our cinemas at Lincoln Center have finally uh, reopened. So for the 50th anniversary, we wanted to highlight a few of our favorite filmmakers who were introduced to New York audiences through this festival. And we wanted to put them in conversation with the programmers who helped shape the identity of this festival. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by two special guests. Uh, we will have the filmmaker Sarah Driver in conversation with Wendy Keyes. Wendy Keyes is um, a founding programmer of New Directors New Films, uh, and she has been a longtime programmer and executive of Film at Lincoln Center. She worked on the New York Film Festival, on her annual gala tributes on New Directors. She is now a board member at Film at Lincoln Center, somebody who has played a huge role at the organization from its earliest days to now. Sarah Driver is the director of films like You Are Not I, When Pigs Fly. Her most recent film, which we showed at the New York Film Festival, um, is Boom For Real, a documentary about Jean-Michel Basquiat. She is also, of course, the director of Sleepwalk, which was featured in New Directors New Films in 1987, uh, and which we presented as part of our anniversary um, retrospective this year. Um, uh, I, just a reminder that you can all use the chat function um, to type in your questions. Um, but I am delighted that we have Wendy here to lead this conversation uh, with Sarah. So I'm going to hand it over now to our two guests, Wendy Keys and Sarah Driver. Thank you so much, both of you, Thanks. for being with us. Thank you, Dennis. And welcome back to New Directors, Sarah. It's so great to see you again, especially in this context, which is where I think we met. We were so proud in 1987 to show your unique and marvelous sleepwalk in our 1987 series. It went on to be awarded the Prix Georges Sadoul by the Cinémathèque Française, and it was the opening night selection of the Semaine de la Critique of the Cannes Film Festival. Also went on to win many other prestigious awards. The critics were delighted by this indie gem, which deliciously mixes surreal fantasy with gritty reality and leads the audience towards surprising revelations. Jonathan Rosenbaum and the Cahiers de Cinema hailed it as one of the best films of the 80s, which is no slouch. Uh, Sleepwalk is your first feature length film. It follows your astonishing debut in 1981 with your short film, You Are Not I, but we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, Luc, Sante, Luc Sant was, once described your films as doorways into the unknown. I was wondering if you could take us through the doorway of Sleepwalk and tell us how it came to be. Um, well, Sleepwalk is really a salute to my love of cinema fantastique, the French genre of cinema, um, which covers you know, science fiction and um, uh, surrealism. And, um, and I, you know, I love the films of Jacques Rivette and, and uh, uh, Tarkovsky and, um, when well, and you know, and and you know, when I was in when I was going to school at NYU, um, I spent most of my time in the movie theater, and and it was great because we had so many retrospective uh, cinemas then, so I could see so many wonderful films, and um, um, that really inspired me, and that was really my education was sitting in the cinema and watching movies, and um, um, and Sleepwalk, I, I kept it, you know, I used to see very weird things. New York was very strange in the early 80s. It was very empty. The city had a very bad reputation because it had gone bankrupt in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, downtown was very, very empty. It was, it was kind of like we sort of owned that part of New York. And I worked in a Xerox shop called Todd's Copy Shop on Mott Street 
when we were on her hiatus for Stranger Than Paradise. Because we made, I produced Stranger Than Paradise. And in 1982, um, we did the first half hour. And then we had, it took us another about a year and a half to find the rest of the money in 1984 and finish the film. But during that time, I worked in a Xerox shop. And I would see very strange things on the street or, and then I would go into the Xerox shop and I would see these flashing lights. And then I started having like these kind of days dreams as I was Xeroxing stuff for people. <laughs> and and I, I kept a journal of all the strange, bizarre things I saw on the street. And, um, and I used the things I saw and just took them a little further uh, into a more surreal plane, uh, more dreamlike plane. Um, but I, I have a great affinity with surrealism and it's, it's something that, you know, it's about the imagination. And, um, and that's one of our greatest gifts, I think, as humans. Yeah, well, you do indeed. And it comes out in the most interesting ways. Um, so you shot the film in your loft building uh, and you say that the, the milieu was, um, well, I remember New York in the eighties, but, but you were in the, in the heat of the, um, the sort of underground uh, downtown art movement too. So this, this creation of the film with the actors that you chose were all kind of folded into that interesting milieu at that point. Um, could you talk about that neighborhood now? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's going through changes and now do you think the post COVID will go through more changes? Well, I'm loving it during, during COVID. Cause it's, it's just like our old city again. Yeah. You know, very empty. Although it's spookier at night than it was. It was spooky then at night, but mm -hmm. now it's really spooky because of everything being shut down. Yeah. But I remember I, I cut my hair very, very short so I could look like a boy and nobody would bother me on the street. Yeah. And I, I kind of learned the mannerisms of walking like a boy too, so that I could be very free at night and, and walk around. Yeah. Um, but you know, that neighborhood has changed so drastically. It's become like the, you know, it's, it's so crowded on weekends, you can't even walk on the street. And when I first lived there, it was just, you know, homeless people and um, nobody really, you know, the idea of living on the Bowery, I don't think many people could conceive of that idea. Mm -hmm. And, but yet living on the Bowery, I had gifts every day because I saw these great interactions between people. Right. And because you were in the middle of it, you know, that was illustrated certainly in your film that you made on Basquiat, Boom for Real. And uh, so you, you, you put that to use, you, but you were also um, not only in the midst of it, you were supporting people. You were, you know, you were both creative and a, and a supporter of the creative community. And I think that's always what's been appreciated and known about you. But to switch gears a little bit, uh, to me, the visual aesthetic of Sleepwalk um, resembles sort of the, the neo-noir Edward Hopper style work of Aki Kuros Mackie. Did you consciously refer to any other director to establish the look of the film? Well, I wanted, I, I remember reading, I think it was um, um, Robert Bresson's Notes on a Cinematographer. And um, he was talking about how color enhances detail and black and white eliminates detail. So I, I thought, why not shoot a color film with the idea that it's black and white? Because um, the light and shadow in that film is very strong. Mm -hmm. and, and eliminate as many details as I can, um, but playing with, with color. Um, you know, I'm so in love with light and shadow and what's really happening in the shadows. And even as a child, you know, I had a wonderful shadow in my bedroom, childhood bedroom, that I was sure I could go through and be in another world. Yeah. And I remember looking at that shadow and thinking about that world that was behind there. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 uh, so many films, I think it was Le Samurai was the one by um, Melville that uh, he actually, uh, he, 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 he made a color film, but he made it feel black and white the way he, he shot it. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I mean, I was influenced by so many filmmakers and, and, and this love of light and shadow and the idea also because I come from theater as well and that you can create something if you can make it something believable, even if you just have a minimal prop, you know, you can create a whole world like on the stage. Mm -hmm. And that idea always kind of fascinated me too. So I'm not surprised to hear you say that uh, when you were a child, you were, you had this fascination for the surreal and your mind opened up into the possibilities of 
what might be considered by some people as non-conventional thinking. Do you think you have a particular gift that you, where you see things where others don't? I think you do, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I do. <laughs> but, um, but, but I mean, there, there are things that you, um, you know, that you toy with. And, and what I love about your work is that it's never whimsical in a corny way or fay or twee. You know, it's all based on um, a real seriousness. There's an intent to it to show that there's, there are things in this world that we don't fully understand. And I think that's what makes you such a unique filmmaker. Um, so just to go back to the construction of the film, the narrative is unresolved and it makes it even more unsettling, um, which I'm sure is your point is that we don't know everything about the world. I mean, do you agree that this is part of what you're, what you're telling us is that there are mysteries there that we'll never really fully understand? Well, I was very, I, I really didn't, I don't like films that, I'm very inter interested in cinema language and experimenting with cinema language. And, you know, we're such a new young art form film. It's a very new form and the language really hasn't been developed. And so the idea of breaking these formulas and these rigid cons cons uh, conventions about how you make a film, what's a, what's a first act, second act, third act, it doesn't really interest me. What interests me is telling stories in new ways using cinema. Um, and I, I had this idea, I remember when I made Sleepwalk, is I didn't wanna to dictate to my audience what to think. I wanted them to look at the film as if it was almost a painting. Yeah. Where, like with a painting, you read in your own ideas of it and your own conclusions. And that's why I decided, I, had, I shot an actual ending for the film, but then at the end I thought, I don't really wanna to dictate to the audience. Yeah. You know, well, that adds to your, your originality, certainly. And, and the feeling of unease and, and self-exploration. So I think that all works well. I just want to take you back. I don't know if you remember, but the night that uh, I introduced Sleepwalk at the at New Directors in 87, I was standing there in the, you know, the microphone in front of the audience telling stories about you and, um, then I introduced you and said, ladies and gentlemen, please meet Sarah Driver. And I was waiting for you to come down the aisle and I was going, Sarah, Sarah. <laughs> and the audience was going crazy. They were laughing like crazy. And I had no idea why. And you were standing right behind me. <laughs> there, was <a> door, <laughs> there was a door at MoMA right there that I had never seen before. I'd worked in that hall for decades. But to me, it was so typical of you both being mysterious and mischievous so i just was wondering do you remember that it was very funny now it comes back to me yeah that was yeah funny. it was very funny it was cute um anyway uh talking about your films dennis lim who introduced us tonight said and if I'll, I'll quote him i see that he's still with us so excuse me dennis but for um and here, here's the quote that for all their supernatural and surrealist flights and their frequent lapses into trance states, Sarah's films remain concretely rooted in their physical realities. The ominous expanses of American exurbia and the eerily desolate lower Manhattan of the 80s. I mean, do you agree that, um, that there's two things going on with you that while you are filled with wonder uh, at, the, at the mysterious and the surreal, that there's, and Jim actually, Jim Jarmusch actually says that it's a wonder that doesn't get jaded, which I think is a very interesting thing to say. But, but I think too, that you're a very grounded person. You would have to be given your production credentials and everything. So do you, do you see those two elements in yourself, both fantastical and grounded? Um, yeah, very much so. I mean, um... Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a schizophrenic thing because I'm very I'm I like to plan, which makes Jim very nervous. Um, I, I'm a big planner, and I and and I'm and because of my producing thing, I like to to uh, produce, but I also like to direct. So, but those two things shouldn't really happen at the same time. Right. Um, they are very conflicting things. Um, 
So, and I, and that was an Achilles heel, I think for me a little bit that I, I've worked on since then realizing I can't do both, even though I love both, I, but they're two separate halves. Yeah. And, but I also think that I'm very, you know, I remember reading about Jacques Turner and he always talked about how if you anchor something in something that's real, you can go anywhere. And that gave me permission. When I read that, that gave me permission. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting quote too. Do you want to talk somewhat about your um, your collaboration with Jim Jarmish, um, both his, you with him and he with you in terms of filmmaking? Um, well, yeah, I mean, at, at the beginning, um, you know, I, I, with permanent vacation, I remember Jim saying to me, I need, we had no money. And he said, uh, I have to get 15 locations for free. So then I had to work on that. You know, he's always giving me challenges. And um, which I I I I I, I, I had fun trying to, trying to get them, um, and like with uh, Stranger in Paradise, we basically made that film with eleven people. There were three actors and eight crew. Uh, I remember the sound guy Drew Coonan, our friend. He he was he wanted a boom person because all of Stranger is master shots, and uh -huh. I couldn't afford a boom person. So poor Drew had to do had to wear the machine and boom. <laughs> And, um, you know, Jim, Jim and I, we've always had fun talking about ideas. We're very different, but we have very similar, we're very different in the way we want to tell stories, but we have very similar um, things that we love and poems and poetry and, and art and uh, music. Um, in that way, we're very similar. And we like to, you know, um, play around with ideas with each other. And that's been a wonderful gift. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and we had to help each other early on. Everybody was pretty, I mean, I was thinking about how Spike was shooting, she's got to have it right before um, I shot Sleepwalk and Lee Shin Yu, who was the assistant camera on that film became my editor on my film. And, and I bought some stuff left over from his film to use on my film. I mean, we were all, it wasn't, it was such a small community of people that were downtown and we were all really helping each other. Um, and, and none of us knew what we were doing. So, you know, it was, it, it, but we were okay with that and trying to figure it out together. Um, and, um, it, it's bit, you know, like Jim, I stopped producing Jim's films because we stopped talking about ideas. We were talking about too much practical things between us. Mm. I had to be the practical one. And I didn't want to be the practical one. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's very conscious. That's very good. <laughs> uh, could you tell us a little bit of, about Vim Bender's collaboration with you on Stranger Than Paradise? You must have had something to do with the, uh, the acquiring the film footage that Vim had donated. Is that yeah. true or is that just urban legend? Vim, it was definitely, um, he had shot State of Things. Yeah. And he had left over 4X negative. And 4X negative is a really high speed stock. So it was really good for a low budget movie because you didn't need many lights. Mm -hmm. And um, and he had this uh, stock left over and then his company gave us the money to make the first half hour of the film. Oh, very nice. Which we shot in, um, in two days because you could rent a camera, a 35 millimeter camera in New York on a Friday and you didn't have to return it till Monday. <laughs> and, and so that's how the first half hour Stranger Than Paradise was shot. There's a question that's come in uh, from M. Moy, Moy or Mall. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, Mall, I guess. Sarah, your films also deal with the slippage of time in both humorous and metaphysical ways. Can you discuss a bit about how time differs for you in the writing and in the execution slash production? Um, 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 I think that the... Uh, I mean, one kind of funny thing was that I had a, a shooting schedule. I mean, this has nothing to do with content in film, but I had a shooting schedule that I thought I had at least uh, 22 night, 20, tw I had 20, a 22 day shooting schedule. I forgot in the summertime that you lose a lot of time uh, at night because uh, nights are very short in the summer. So I lost like a whole day that I hadn't accounted for just because I was shooting in the summer, but that's a different, time element. Um, I don't know, time, time is just such a, a abstract thing. Um, 
And I like the feeling that, well, it's sort of like what we're in right now of that we don't know where we are time-wise. It's kind of like my films. Yeah. You know, I hadn't really thought about it before, but it's, it, time is not really a consideration in my films. And um, it's not conscious. It, I'm not doing it consciously, but it, it's part of the, it's part of just the nature of how I tell stories, I guess. Yeah. I'm not sure how to answer that. It was probably not a satisfying answer, but um. <laughs> no. But you came up with a revelation that you had that hadn't occurred to you before. That COVID time is, in its new way, kind of unique, and yet in that things meld and merge in ways that they didn't when we had more structured schedules and had things to do. So you know, I was. Thinking now we've all slipped into a Sarah Driver film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I was doing a little research. I was curious because uh, this new script that I have ready that I'm, I want to shoot um, is also in a world of, you've read it, Wendy. Yes. It's also in a world of, of kind of quantum physics and time and because I'm also obsessed with science and, um, and, um, uh, and I was thinking about how the films that are, were considered surrealism or film fantastique, like starting with George, um, George Melies and uh, on that started in World War One, and then, then there was a big. Then it sort of found fantastic, sort of disappeared, and then it seemed to appear again during World War Two, mm -hmm. and then it appeared again during the sixties and the seventies, which were a turbulent time, and it's mm -hmm. a kind of pure form of escapism. Mm -hmm. Right. Gosh. Um, tell us a little bit about your actresses. Suzanne Fletcher is just astonishing. She's a marvel and she was so good in, in this and You Are Not I. And, uh, and Stranger Than Paris, she was, in, was she in Stranger oh, She was in Paris. Paris. Education. But how did you find her? Suzanne had been, um, had gone to Barnard and Jim knew him, her, her when he was at Columbia. And then we were all living in the same neighborhood downtown and had become friends. And, um, and I ha we had such a good experience on You Are Not I. And I basically, I, I always had her in the back of my mind when I was writing the script, although I did think about other actors, but then she just was so perfect. And, and she was in my mind's eye, you know, when I was do keeping my journals, when I was kind of writing down the things that I witnessed in New York. Yeah. Um, and we were very good friends and, and she's a wonderful collaborator. She's, she's a, got an amazing mind and, um, and physical appearance. And, um, and you know, she, was, she, she always helped me in, in, in so many ways, you know, and, and led me through things, which I think great actors do that with directors. And Anne Magnuson too was a, oh, was a gift to work with, was really great. No, she was a performance artist. Yeah, and I didn't know her personally when I cast her, um, but I always, I, I knew of her from the scene yeah. And she always had this kind of Shirley MacLaine. I know. Downtown Shirley MacLaine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was really great to work with Anne, too. Was this her first film as an actress or, or had she been another film? Oh. I, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw her in something recently. I'm always happy to see her. She was in a film by Bill Richard, too. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, let's talk about You Are Not I, which is such a wonderful piece. It is based on a short film by Paul Bowles. And it's seriously, it remains on my top 10 list of favorite films forever. Oh, Wendy, thank you. I urge everybody to see it. Um, and I just want to say that the confidence and rigor and sleight of hand that you put that you pull off here is astonishing as a first time director and even for a veteran director it would have been astonishing. So could you tell us, there's a wonderful lost and found story of this film. Could you tell us a little bit about that adventure? Yeah, um, well, the film, um, you know, was shot in 16 millimeter black and white, which is a very delicate film stock. Um, and I had sent a, a copy, you know, at that time in 1981, I made it, first I made the film, I fell in love with this story. It was a seven page story. And I had been reading a lot of Paul Bowles. I, I really, he's one of my favorite writers. And I read this story and I was so shocked by the ending that I thought I have to make this into a movie and I have to make it exactly how I read the story. Yeah. And, and, and this feeling that I had of shock at the end. And um, um, 
And then I, I was, it was for, a, uh, it was for my graduate project school, you know, graduate master's degree, you know, project. And, and so I thought, oh, okay, I'll shoot it. And then I, and then I, and I, I wasn't sure what would happen. And then I started working on it. And, and then, um, and then, you know, and then I contact, I was able to contact Paul Bowles and he gave me the rights to it. And then I sent him a print of the film because there was no VHS then there was, you had to send an actual print. So I sent him a print with a, a guy, he it was hand carried to Tangier, Paul Bowles was living in Tangier. Mm -hmm. um, and it was hand carried by a guy whose, whose parents had been friends with Paul and Jane. And he brought it to Paul and he, and he projected it for Paul. And then Paul and I started this correspondence. And many years later, uh, there was a story, I had the, the, the film in storage and it, and it was destroyed. Um, I can't remember if it was a fire, it was a fire in the storage unit. And I think it was a fire. And then, um, cause I get, I get confused whether it's water or fire but it was one of the two that's very damaging. And, um, and so I, we thought the film was totally lost. This was around 2010 or something. And I was so embarrassed and, her, and it was like, you know, it was heartbreaking. I, it was, I thought it was completely gone. And then I got this call out of the blue from these academics, uh, these archivists who were archiving Paul Bowles's, all of what Paul Bowles had. And they said, we found your film among Paul Bowles's things. And I was, and I had forgotten, I had sent him a print. Yeah, thank And God. it was off the original negative. So it was a very beautiful, pristine print. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the archivist was like, we're really amazed because this is a black and white film and it's in perfect condition. I mean, with the weather in Tangier, how did that happen? It, it, it's because we found it in a cardboard box. And I said to the archivist, I said, because I couldn't afford a metal can at that time <laughs> for the film. And if it had been in a metal can, it probably would have been destroyed by the humidity. But oh. because it was in a cardboard box, there was air going in there. So um, when the, um, uh, Masterworks at New York Film Festival wanted to show the film. Um, uh, we were given a grant by uh, Women Make Movies and we were able to make a copy off of that film um, that they found in Tangier and, um, and make a, an HD uh, copy of it as well. And um, that's how the film was saved. It was saved by Francis Poole, the archivist, who, who, uh, who, who was, who was uh, you know, working on Paul's archive. And it was very interesting because he sent me a picture of it and it was under Paul and Jane's typewriters. Oh my God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then of oh, course you, you have a fondness for Jane Bowles too. Yes, and I do. That's a, that's a project that I'd love to see come to fruition. I know that there's uh, a Jane Bowles story that you'd like to see come to the screen. So well, it looks like Susan and I are producing one together. Are you doing oh, another it? Another director. There's another director who's going to do it. Oh, that's very good news. Yeah, for two yep. series ladies. Yes. Yeah. Are you rewriting the script then? From oh, this is all in the director's. It's all in, in in her court. Do you want to talk more about it, or is it too early to? Um, well, yeah. we're very thrilled by the director, so um, and we're hoping it all happens. But I I'd like to wait till it gets a little more sure. together. Yeah. Um, there's also talk there with uh, IndieWire announced that you were uh, considering making a documentary on Charles Adams. What is the status of that at this point? Well, you know, it, that we were starting to, to work on that um, and, and, then, and then COVID happened. And now it's so hard to get financing or, you know, we really don't know where a lot of things stand. But it would be, you know, he really introduced black humor into the United States, you know, into, into the 20th century, in the yeah. mid 20th century. It did, yeah. And he was somebody who, who embraced the weirdos and the outsiders. Yeah. And I'm from the same hometown as Charles Adams. And I grew up with people whose parents worked with Charles Adams at the New Yorker and things yeah. like that. And one of my best friends growing up was Joan Fullerton and her grandfather was Guy Fullerton who was Charles Adams's best friend. And, um, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that he's had such an impact on us culturally that we don't, a lot of us don't even know. Yeah, we know him, but, you know, we don't think of really his overall effect on us. And that, that kind of black humor is something that you've, in a sort of a deadpan way, you have sort of seeping through everything that you do. So 
I guess. He was probably one of my earliest influences because I grew up before the Adams Family TV show. Yeah. I was, I had those books, those cartoon books were in my family home. So I was always looking at his cartoons and you always had to find the gag, you mm -hmm. know, it's sort of like also working with light and shadow where you're not sure what's really lurking back there. And it's the same with Charles Adams when you look, and it was so fun as a child to discover what the gag was that he wanted right. to get, you know, you had to work a little bit. Well, that's okay. I think most good art, you do need to work a little bit. You have to be engaged. Speaking of art, um, I was I was interested to discover that you curate uh, sort of art shows, or at least I, I went to an art fair one year and, and found you at uh, Spring Break and you had done some curation of some artists there. Tell us a little bit about that part of your career, of your life. Well, you know, I, I keep thinking, I'm sort of working on my gravestone. I would like to just have the word instigator. Okay. If I can earn the word instigator, I will have lived a full life. And being able to, um, to, to bring artists that I admire um, to get, help them get their signal out is, is for me, it's a kind of, um, it's something that, that, that really means a lot to me. And, um, uh, you know, I got involved with Spring Break, you know, they're the kids that run it, Andrew Gorey and Amber Kelly are, you know, Andrew had worked as a production assistant on Limit, I think it was on Limits of Control of Jim's film. And that's how I first met Andrew, who is one of the founders of Spring Break. And I went to their first, and, and Spring Break was a little bit like the Times Square show because they their whole philosophy was to find abandoned spaces. Yeah. Um, all, and which they're still doing. So it's not the same people, the Times Square show and Spring Break? I no, Times Square show was like early 80s. That was, that was when, when the downtown artists decided it was time to, to, to go uptown because they were being ignored by the gallery people. Mm. And they, they got this, uh, uh, um, you know, had been, it had been like a whorehouse or whatever um, in Times Square. And, they, and all these different artists did all the different rooms and everything. And that's sort of the philosophy behind Spring Break. And there's an energy in Spring Break because again, a lot of the people being shown there are not in the, uh, the, the official art world. And Spring Break happens at the same time as the Armory show. Mm -hmm. so it's, um, and, um, and, it, and it's grown every year it grows and grow it was growing until COVID happened. Um, and, um, and the kids that run it are just wonderful. And, and it's all different artists of different ages. And I'm very honored that they asked me to curate and, and bring in artists. And I've done it, I've done it, I think four or five times. Mm -hmm. And I, and then one of the, one moment that was very moving, um, when, when spring break was on, uh, it was, it was on two floors above the 34th street post office. Mm -hmm. And the, and it was all abandoned that above the post office was complete. Yeah. All those floors were abandoned and it's, it was a beautiful building, but you know, there were pigeons coming in and windows broken and everything. And, um, and, uh, Alexis Adler, who's, who Jean-Michel Basquiat lived with and who's the work that she had kept of his that inspired Boom For Real. Mm -hmm. um, we decided we would show uh, her photographs of Jean-Michel at the age of 18, 19, um, and her, his works of art. And, it, and in another room have a, the works of art, but we wouldn't announce it. We just let people find it. And it was so great for pe people to walk in and see these young pictures, beautiful picture photos she took of Jean-Michel and then to go in the next room and actually see the artwork and be so close to it and yeah. see how he had, he, had, he had done drawings on her you know, stationery from Rockefeller University because she was going there when she lived with Jean Michel. Um, but when we unrolled the, her photographs of Jean in that kind of funky space, it felt so like right for him, you know? And it yeah. was just, I almost started crying. It was, yeah, I, I so love right to see him in that environment, you know? That sounds terrific. I mean, Creative Time used to do that, find abandoned spaces and put on art things. I, I wonder if there are many abandoned, well, there'll probably be far more abandoned spaces yeah. in New York now. Um, probably, yeah. I mean, you can go to the Empire State Building and take over three floors for a, um, an art show now. 
Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a question, um, kind of a, a, a comment from Anne-Katrine Titsi, friends of yours, I think. Greetings from Anne-Katrine and Ed. Oh, hi. It, <laughs> in, in You Are Not I, Ethel Rosembers Dreyer's Joan of Arc, shifting towards Virginia Woolf at times. Please comment. <laughs> um, what was the question again? Well, it's uh, referring to Ethel, the, the central character of You Are Not I. She, uh, she, she resembles Dreyer's Drone of Arc, shifting towards Virginia Woolf at times. Huh, that's interesting. You know, I didn't see Joan of Arc until, The Passion of St. Joan, until after I made You Are Not I, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a movie all about how eyes tell everything. Well, how you don't, language is so secondary in yeah. cinema. It's the reverse of theater. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, but I don't know about possibly Virginia Woolf. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. I have to think about it. Okay. Well, you know who to get back to. And I will. I'll get back. And waiting for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have greetings uh, from New Orleans from Carol Bideau de Lille. Oh, hello. Hi, Carol. <laughs> Carol's involved with my next film. Oh, good. Now, which which of your three next films is that? Uh, the Odd Enchantment of, of Madame P, with, uh, okay. that I wrote for my very good friend, Nicoletta Brosky. Yes, yes. And uh, she, uh, she is, so the people know, she is the wife of, of Roberto Benigni, but so, many, so much more. She's well, she's an actress. incredible actress. Yeah, she is. And, and actually, she's been touring with Happy Days for a few years now, with Beckett's Happy Days. She's wow. been doing theater, more theater than, than films, but she's wonderful, just wonderful. I'm, I'm so, we're so excited because we've been talking for 35 years about making a film together. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and talking ideas. And then at one point, all these ideas just started flooding back to me. And I wrote the script fairly quickly. And it's, it, I mean, it was, it sort of surprised me how quick it came. But um, so we're preparing that right now. And I'm also working with Aurelia Terry on that, who's um, Charlie Chaplin's granddaughter. My. And she's an illusionist and grew up in a circus of illusions with her mother, Victoria oh. and father. And, um, and so it's, and she's almost like a silent character in the film. And she's got these wonderful eyes and, and um, um, you know, and she's able to do all these incredible sort of wonderful, she, she, her performances are incredible. We, have, we haven't stayed at, she performed at Lincoln Center a few years ago. Mm. And I hope, she, I hope her whole company comes back, her parents' company yeah. comes back. Was it in a summer series or, or yeah, something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you've got three exciting uh, projects ahead of you. I'm, I'm sure you can't wait until the the curtain lifts so that you can really buckle down. And yeah, yeah. everybody will be anticipating Charles <laughs> Adams and Nicoletta and, jo and Jane Bowles. It's a great trio. So um, anyway, I think we've kind of wrapped it up unless there's anything that you'd like to say further to well, I'd like to say one thing. I, I met these two young boys, um, Louis and Noah Kloster, at a Lincoln Center talk that I had done. And they're now making a cartoon of me. And they did a wonderful cartoon of David Godless. Oh, really? Who yeah. has turned in. I, I understand he's watching. Hi, David. And, <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and we started talking, they're doing one about, it was something, uh, an incident that happened when I, we were doing financing on the rest of Stranger Than Paradise. Mm -hmm. And um, and we wanted, and he, and so they want to do a series of cartoons of filmmakers and their stories about filmmaking, like outrageous ones. And I told them about, you know, about the Barbe Schroeder film, Raj, uh, his, his, his story where he went in for Barfly. I uh -huh. want to a, a Barbe because yeah. uh, he couldn't get the rights back to, he somebody had put up development money. Barbet wanted to buy the rights back for the same amount they had put in. They weren't going to give him his rights. So Barbet came in with a black and decker saw and he was going to cut off his fingers. Oh my God. And he started. Oh my God. And they gave him his rights back. 
<laughs> but we, you, so uh, Louis and Noah are going to pursue these different stories that different yeah. filmmakers have gone through as yeah. animation. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Um, there's a question that's come in from Jonathan Rosenbaum, who I know is a great fan of yours. I'm a great fan of Jonathan's. Hi, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. uh, his question is, hi, Sarah. What's your favorite film seen so far during the pandemic? I think Death of a Scoundrel with George Sanders. Great. Uh, that's a very odd film. Um, what else? I've seen so many. They're all kind of merging together at this point. Mm -hmm. um, um, much, I don't know. I'm sort of blanking. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> um, no, Death of a Scoundrel is something to think of about um and sometimes you know in fact i think i the film i think we we want to watch the serious films the ones that will take us down an interesting road and sometimes we just need junk and um, <laughs> i don't know if i'm the only one uh, but i really find some relief in just watching really bad things that i won't share with anybody because it's too embarrassing but uh there's a, a message from leon falk Greetings from Leon Falk. So great to hear both of you in conversation. Can't wait to see the new film when it's done. So I guess- uh, well, that... He read the script too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Well, it's tantalizing. Ah, oh, thank you. Anyway, so great to see you, Sarah. We'll all get together. Oops, maybe there's another one here. This is, no, I think that's it. So we'll get together when we're allowed, when we feel comfortable and when uh, there's, plenty to do. Lincoln Center's Film Society, Film at Lincoln Center is open. So um, we can meet at the movies. Well, now we're back vaccinated too. That helps. Yes. yes, indeed. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you Great so much. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>